Good afternoon, everyone. And I think most people in Central Time, maybe some are in Eastern. Good afternoon, early evening. Welcome to the 2021 Mary Alice Davis Distinguished Lecture Series. And first of all, I wanna thank Jim and Jan and Rachel Davis for starting this fabulous lecture series in 2005. And um, it's all about Mary Alice Davis and I'll explain a little bit more about her in a minute, but thank you for sponsoring this series. This year, our distinguished lecturer is Joe Yeoman, who is a Washington Post food editor and writer and cookbook author. And yes, we all want his job. <laughs> um, he graduated from University of Texas. I'm not quite sure of the year. He'll have to tell us because I keep finding different years. So um, he might have been like me, someone who graduated one year, but maybe really graduated another year. I'm not so sure. But anyway, he's written four books now, I believe. And um, he, as I said, is at the Washington Post where he does a weeknight vegetarian column and he's done fabulous books, Cooking for One and um, Eat Your Vegetables and Serve Yourself. In addition, he is, um, what else can I say about him? He is from Texas. He grew up here and um, he's, I would love for him to tell us a bit of his roots. He's the grandson of Assyrian refugees, a member of the Arab and Middle Eastern Journalists Association. And he and his husband, Carl, live with Lasco the cat and Nelson the dog. I think I got that right, but I might've gotten it kind of backwards. Roscoe. Roscoe, oh, okay. Well. <laughs> <sighs> Here's what's super cool though. Interviewing Joe after he makes some introductory remarks will be Zoe Zanis who is an editor on the life and arts section at the Daily Texan, where Joe worked back in the day. But before I turn this over to Joe, I just wanna give a couple of minutes to Mary Alice Davis. She is our kind of UT grad. Um, she retired as a statesman columnist and editorial writer in 2002. Um, she grew up in Texas. She received her journalism degree here in 1965 where she worked at the Daily Texan before starting her 38 year career as a professional writer and editor. Um, she married a journalist, Jim Davis. They had a daughter, Rachel. And what another cool thing about uh, Mary Alice is unlike a lot of women of her time, Joe, she didn't cook. They ate a lot of takeout. And this was back when I think it was expected of women to cook, but she didn't. But apparently once she made meatloaf for Jim, and Jim thought it was going to be like, mm. so he put ketchup on it before even tasting it. And she blew a gasket and he covered, recovered quickly and said, oh, I thought it was going to be as dry as my mom's meatloaf. <laughs> Good save, Jim. Anyway, we lost uh, Mary Alice Davis in 2004 to ovarian cancer. But thanks to the Davis family and the generosity of others, we were able to start this lecture series in 2005, and it began with Maureen Dowd. Since then, other distinguished lecturers include Molly Ivins, David Carr, John Avalon, Pam Koloff, Aisha Rasko, Krista Thompson, who also is at the Washington Post, but Joe's in a completely different section. So I think it's fine that we have our proud UT Washington Post grads back to back. And now I turn it over to Joe. Thank you so much, Kathleen. I, I am not sure how I feel about being uh, following such names as um, Maureen Dowd and Molly Ivins, but I will try to live up to your expectations of me. I'm honored um, to be here. And you know what's, what's funny about um, what I just what I just learned about Mary Alice Davis is that she graduated from UT in 1965, which is the year that I was born. So I graduated from UT in 1989. Somehow I think that that's not the year that Zoe was born, or this would be an incredibly fortuitous set of circumstances. Um, but I'm so glad that you asked me um, to speak because, you know, I was thinking about this, and when I was getting ready to graduate from UT in 
1989 with a journalism degree. I think if you had asked me what food journalism was, I don't think I would have had an answer. And I, I think it's because it probably would have been the first time that I had even heard that term. And why is that? I, it's not because food journalism didn't exist. In fact, there have been food sections at newspapers for a century. But, you know, to be honest, they just weren't part of the otherwise fantastic study of the history and practice of journalism that I got at UT. And I think they haven't been really studied in a lot of, of um, academic settings. And I think they were really taken for granted, these early newspaper food sections. Um, I think that they were in some ways ignored and misunderstood and maybe even mischaracterized a little bit because their practitioners were all women and the content had emerged from the so-called women's pages. And you made um, a reference to Mary Alice Davis's, um, you know, not cooking. And of course that was very common among um, a lot of professional women. Of course, there was um, an association with cooking and, and really an anti-feminist idea, which, you know, Gloria Steinem once denigrated newspaper food sections as, as journalistic ghettos. Um, thankfully, she later came around. Um, because despite what a lot of food historians might have you believe, these pages were far from fluff. There's a really fabulous book I highly recommend any um, of you listening who are interested in food journalism read. It's um, a 2014 book by Kimberly Wilmot Voss called The Food Section, Newspaper Women and Culinary Community. And she writes about how these editors and writers were chronicling local foodways and history, and they were profiling cooks in their communities. They were covering food safety news and of course recipes. And they were really on the front lines of helping their readers understand what and how to cook and how to eat. They were very different from their counterparts at national food magazines where the dividing line between editorial and advertising was much blurrier and the ethical lapses were frequent at the magazines. But these were women who had either trained as journalists but couldn't get a job in what was a male dominated field or they might have been home economists or writers who were interested in the subject and learned journalism on the job. This all started changing in 1970s. Um, the women's, women's so-called women's pages started either folding or were renamed or were subsumed into other parts of the papers. And men started becoming food editors. Um, and no surprise, there started becoming a little bit more of attention paid to them. Um, Craig Claiborne at the New York Times earned so much acclaim, even though his predecessor, a woman named Janet Nickerson, was really the one that helped create this culinary scene in New York that included Julia Child and James Beard. So when I was thinking about what I wanted to say to you today, I wanted to talk about that. And I also wanted to say, yeah, you'd think that food journalism would be so much better known and understood now. I mean, after all, a newspaper food critic has won the Pulitzer Prize. Um, but in some ways, I think the association of food journalism with food criticism is part of the problem because even today, if I'm at a dinner party and I people ask me what I do and I tell them I'm the food editor of the Washington Post, the very first thing that they say is something like, wow, it must be great to get to eat at all those restaurants for free. <laughs> and then just to write your opinion about them. Um, you know, and I'll say, actually, I'm not a restaurant critic. I supervise all the food coverage and the features department at the Post and the stories that we uh, write include food trends, investigations, profiles, recipe pieces, cooking tutorials, and yes, restaurant reviews. And I can see their eyes glazing over and they say, so do you wear a disguise? You know, and I just shake my head. Um, so now I've learned the fastest way to explain what I do is to say, I'm not the food critic, I'm the food critic's boss. <laughs> that usually works. Um, so that brings me back around to this question. What exactly is food journalism? I'm sure you all have your own thoughts about it, but just for me to be clear, it's just as simple as journalism that focuses on food as a topic. But food stories can be about so many things other than just the food. And that's because food touches on everything in our lives. So 
good food journalism today is about recipes and ingredients, sure. It's about what it's like to eat at certain restaurants, yes. But it's also about history and race and culture and gender and civil rights and work and family and memory and gentrification and sexual harassment and LGBTQIA pride and climate change and politics and art and science. Is there anything that food journalism can't be about? I have yet to find it. Um, I do think that there are some misconceptions about food journalism still that remain today. And there's, a, there's an off, often sort of repeated trope, um, a feel good trope about food sort of bringing everyone together. And that if we could just all eat at the same table, we would under, we'd be able to talk to each other and understand each other. And I do think that there's um, some truth to that. And food journalism, I think, can get us there, can bring people to that table. But food can also divide us. Um, food is a point of cultural division. It's a point of class division. And um, food journalism needs to explore the roots of those divisions as much as it explores the roots of the commonalities. Um, food journalism can be so much more than people sometimes think. I've edited a hilarious essay about a writer who spent two weeks trying every pumpkin spice product she could find. <laughs> she wrote about how after two weeks, her, her um, armpit smelled like nutmeg. Um, and I've edited an investigation of just what horrors chef Mario Batali committed on unsuspecting women who were under his control. And those two pieces were by the same writer. Um, I've edited a piece by a Vietnamese woman who ate at Asian restaurants while she was recovering from a hate crime and how those meals helped her recover. I commissioned and edited a piece by a writer named Lazarus Lynch um, on the Juneteenth holiday in which he, sure, he attached his recipe for jerk chicken, but he wrote about how rather than celebrate the holiday in the wake of the deaths of George Floyd and other black people killed by police, he wanted to send smoke up into the sky from his barbecue pit in their memory. I edited an essay by a writer who told the history of Mexico's pan de muerto made for the day of the dead celebration as I'm sure you all know and how making it connected her to all her ancestors. I've edited pieces about a lawsuit alleging that the tuna in Subway's tuna sandwiches isn't even tuna, might not even be fish. <laughs> and, and I edited a dive into the best 25 sandwiches in DC and a piece about how the death by suicide of Anthony Bourdain caused a writer to want to come clean about his own struggles with depression. And those last three pieces are all by the same writer. My own food writing has covered quite a gamut too. I spent two weeks once eating at every food truck in Boston packing plenty of antacids and digestive enzymes to get me through. Um, and another time I hit every supposedly good pizza place in the area with a New York pizza expert who at one point in the meal, when I started to complain that my stomach was hurting um, at our eighth or 10th pizza place, he looked me straight in the eye and said, Joe, the good ones learn to eat through the pain. I've always remember that. I once wrote about a regular hunting trip taken by four Italian chefs in Boston, three of whom are named Tony. I really enjoyed writing that lead because I didn't use any last names. Another time I wrote about a Puerto Rican family who roasted a whole suckling pig on a rotating spit at least once a year in advance of the city's biggest cultural festival and parade. Not the Irish parade, not the St. Patrick's Day parade, the Puerto Rican parade. Um, and for that, I had to defend the use of an incredible photo that the art director didn't want to use and that the food editor was reluctant about too. It was this overhead shot of the table and the roasted pig was splayed out on it and the father of the family was poised with a hatchet to start cutting it up. I thought it was amazing. But the designer and editor didn't want to run it because they thought that it was too graphic in its display of the animal and that it would turn too many readers off. And I remember one of them said to me, would you write a story about people who eat monkey brains and will we publish a picture of it? And I said, if every year there were a festival that drew hundreds of thousands of people to the park to celebrate the eating of monkey brains, yes, I think I would <laughs> write a story about it. 
I won the argument, by the way. And I don't think we had a single reader complain about the roast pig photo. Now at the post, I write much less than I did at the Boston Globe due to the, demand, due to, due to the demands of editing, but I try to keep my hand in. Earlier this year, I wrote about ways to cut food waste by using up the trims and scraps of the produce, produce that you're using, you know, right in the moment rather than saving it for some time later when your motivation will be gone. Um, and during the pandemic, I've been pitching in with all our writers to help readers who have been so distraught and upset about not just coronavirus, but how to cook for themselves and their family. I've written twice in my column about being a new foster dad, uh, the first time centering on learning to cook for him while realizing that the most important thing, really possibly more important than getting him to eat his vegetables, was to help keep him feel safe and comfortable and happy. Recently, I revisited the topic and it was through, sadly, through my grief at his departure from our home, my inability to find the motivation to cook and a recipe that helped me find my way back. My point with all of this is that I view food journalism as a window into humanity, which I think is what all good journalism is um, on some level. I, um, I think a lot about Tony Bourdain. I mentioned him a little earlier and he certainly brought what was ultimately really good food journalism to a wider audience with his television shows. Although I'm not sure the average viewer would really think of it um, necessarily as journalism. But Tony and his ability to cut through that soft focus haze of so much food travel television focused on real journalistic stories and a commitment to honesty. And so he always struck me as a real journalist at heart. I hope that in my talk today, that hearing me today and in the questions that you ask and that Zoe asked and that I answer, I hope you end up realizing if you didn't already that the field of food journalism is full of just the richest possibilities for you to cover pretty much any aspect of the world with food as a lens. Everything is a food story. It's just up to you to find it. Thank you. All right. Um, so I have a lot of questions. Um, for <laughs> okay. <you. laughs> um, Good. <laughs> I so, like questions. Uh, you've, you've mentioned a bunch of different roles that food journalists can play in a lot of different places for food mm -hmm. journalism. And there's, there's food reviewing, there is restaurant critique, there's recipe sharing, there's different traditions, you know, sharing um, windows into different cultures. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot but can you speak to the importance or the place for, or the value of, of some of these differing roles? And then I guess as a follow-up, uh, what, what is your favorite role to take on <laughs> and, and why? <laughs> um, well, I think they all serve different purposes. Um, it sort of depends on what aspect of food, um, not only the writer's interested in, but really what serves the story. Um, I often think, you know, everybody eats, so everybody has a food story. Um, I happen to think that, you know, I'm drawn a lot to nostalgic food stories. So pieces about uh, memory and family, um, which are suited very naturally to, um, to food, of course, because, you know, the sense of smell is the is our strongest connection to memory. It's been proven. Um, it can trigger our memory stronger than any other scent. I don't know if if um, the audience has experienced that, but you can catch a whiff of something, and it will put you in a moment like nothing else. Um, and taste, you know, is really mostly smell. Like what we refer to as flavor is a combination of actually taste and 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 smell. Um, and so those kinds of stories can be really evocative. Um, so I, I really like those. I think that stories that that get to um, the get at culture and cultural history, I think are very important, especially now when we're trying to, in food media and media in general, but certainly in food media, 
we're really trying to make sure that we don't come at food from a whitewash perspective, that we, you know, make sure that we're reflecting the different cultural values and backgrounds and histories of the vast diversity of the American public and our readership. So those I think are very important um, ways to do that. Restaurant reviews you would think would just be, you know, is it good enough to eat here? Um, is it worth my money um, here? That that would be the mission of those pieces. And there's a big aspect of that, you know, um, food journalism in some senses is, a, is consumer service journalism. And I think food criticism fits into that. You know, restaurants can be expensive. People need to make choices. You wanna help them know where to go. But people are making decisions about where to eat and what to eat based on a lot of things these days. So as they should, as they should feel the right to. So um, even restaurant criticism can be about, you know, can get into food sourcing. It can get into um, employment practices um, and can help people make the decision about where to spend their money based on even more than just, you know, was the creme brulee you know, creamy enough. Um, I, you know, I have a personal bias toward, as I said, nostalgic stories and also, re you know, recipes. I do think that recipes um, can be a window into um, really powerful meanings and memories. And the, the piece that I referred to about um, being flummoxed about what to cook and um, in, the, in the wake of the grief of losing our foster son, was the first time that I really tried to intertwine um, recipe description with, with memory and grief and descriptions of feelings. Um, and I think, it, I think it really resonated with a lot of people. I've gotten a lot of, of, of responses to it. So um, personally, I like writing pieces that touch people. The other thing though I have to say is that I really appreciate humor in in journalism and in writing and in food writing. And I think that anytime we can provide um, a laugh for people, especially now um, when people really, people need a laugh possibly more than, they either need a curtain, they either need a really good laugh or a really good cry. I gave people a pretty good cry with my last column. And I, I but I like to, I like to find things that will also give them a laugh and help them kind of put the world into a little bit maybe better perspective for their own sanity. Yeah, so you talked a bit, um, a lot actually, about uh, the, the ways in which food can be a window into culture. Mm -hmm. um, and so I guess uh, from, from uh, the perspective of a, a food journalist, how can um, writing about food be a window into not only talking about other cultures, but perhaps telling untold stories and untold histories. Um, I've uh, I've done a lot of um, you know uh, taking in food media myself, and uh, the series on Netflix. I think it was High on the Hog. Um, uh -huh. really, yeah, really for me, um, like represented this this unique way to share food and, and include history. Uh, can you speak a little bit to the role of, of using food to tell untold stories and untold histories like that? Sure, um, that was an amazing series. And uh, Je Jessica Harris, um, whose book it's based on, um, I've known her for many years and um, had the chance to talk to her um, at length. And she's an incredible resource. Um, yeah, I think that I think that the key here has also been making sure that we journalists and editors allow space for people to tell more of their own stories. So I think that for um, the longest time, the you know we've had a diversity problem in food media, um, like a lot of media, and so what ends up happening is the even people, journalists who uncover these untold stories and bring them to a wider audience um, are still often not representative of the culture that they're writing about. And I'm not saying that you have to only write or that you can only write about cultures that, you're, that are yours, 
because I think that would be terrible and that's sort of anti-journalistic in a way. Um, but the but the balance was so uh, lopsided. So there were there were just not enough voices from from a good variety of cultures. So um, so it's hugely important to seek out um, these voices and try to try to find these stories. I think it's also important to make sure that we as media gatekeepers that we avoid the trap of of treating some of these untold stories like they're discoveries um, and that foods are particular discoveries, you know, the Columbusing effect, you know, like I didn't know about the spy. So because I didn't know about it, it must be new to everyone or it must be new to everyone like me is what, you know, you're, you're kind of saying. Um, and that's, I think that can have its own pitfalls. So, um, I haven't tried to limit the voices of people that I work with. I've tried to bring in more voices um, from, from various cultures. But I think like a good example was that um, the piece about the, uh, the Puerto Rican pig roast that I mentioned earlier is just an example um, of something that I did in which I wasn't part of the story at all. You know, it wasn't about me. That's not my background. That wasn't, you know, that's not my family, but I was approaching it from a journalistic perspective. And, and I think I, it's, it's ridiculous that that was an untold story um, because it's, because as I mentioned, the, the festival draws hundreds of thousands of people to the park every year and people roast pigs all over the city of Austin. It's just that, it's just that the mainstream media, you know, hadn't really connected with it. Um, and, and I think the reaction that I got from my editors and then the reaction that I got from my readers who were really happy to hear about it and read about it and found it really fascinating was really telling. You know, people want, people want those stories. Yeah. So on, on that, um, I mean, can can food be the space that we dismantle the the white um, hegemony in sort of in, in in our culture? And when we do that, when we attempt to type to diversify um, our media through for, through food journalism, how do we do that in a way that um, that doesn't appropriate um, that always highlights and elevates yeah i think that it can i absolutely think that it can um i think that the key to avoiding appropriation i think there i think that there is a big difference between appropriation and celebration and i think that it's all a matter of research and scholarship and sourcing just like any good journalism is and respect um, so the, um, making sure that you speak to as many people, if you're writing about a culture that you're unfamiliar with, making sure that you speak to as many people as possible and center those voices in your piece, I think is the key, um, rather than, um, you know, when you come at it from a, from a, um, an appropriation standpoint, it's what comes out, especially when you're talking about recipes, are inclinations like, um, like using the word, ex using the words exotic and, um, and, um, and, and talking about things, talking about wishing that something were more uh, accessible to a mainstream audience, like those are all red flags, right? And they're, um, when it comes to recipes, those are, those can be real minefields. And I think that it's just a matter of realizing that, you know, as a journalist, you need to do your homework and find sources that help you understand cultures and, and also not treating things, you know, like they're, alien to you, um, celebrating differences. Yeah. 
So I know you mentioned this a little bit and um, you talked to me a little bit about it, but could you speak to the role of recipes, recipe sharing, including recipes in food journalism? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, recipes are one of the biggest currencies in food journalism. And, um, and you would think that, I mean, honestly, there are millions and millions and millions of recipes out there in the world. So you would think that you like who needs another recipe for, you know, um, well, take your pick. But people want good, dependable recipes because they want to feed themselves in an interesting way and they want to learn new things in the kitchen. Um, and I do think that recipes can be a really great way for people to learn about their own culture and about other cultures. Um, you know, you, you realize kind of commonalities when you cook recipes. Um, you know, you also realize complexity and, and you realize that things aren't as simple as you thought they were when you dive into recipes. So for instance, um, anyone who thinks that, um, that there's really such a thing as Mexican food um, hasn't traveled much in, much in Mexico and certainly hasn't eaten uh, much in the different parts of Mexico and has certainly not tried to cook recipes from different regions of Mexico <laughs> because you realize that much like with Indian food, for example, that there is no such thing as just Mexican food. There are many many cuisines in Mexico. In fact, one of the biggest, um, most impactful books about Mexican cooking was um, by a woman, Diana Kennedy, who's a white British woman um, who um, really dove into scholarship and has lived in Mexico now for many, many, many decades. But her first book was called The Cuisines, plural, of Mexico. And it made a huge impact, partly because she opened people's eyes to the fact that it wasn't all, you know, one thing. Um, we, we recently had a big outcry at the Post over a, a column that was in the Post magazine that I thankfully had absolutely nothing to do with. Um, that was by a humor columnist who wrote, who kind of denigrated Indian food. And he wrote about it as all being based on one spice, among other things that he said, which was a crazy, crazy thing to say, particularly about Indian food, because Indian food is one of the most beautifully complex um, cuisines. And, and, and again, like Mexican cuisine, there are many, many, many cuisines in India. It's one of the most beautifully complex cuisines in the world. Um, so, it was, it was ridiculous. And I spent a lot of time deflecting and, um, and trying to make clear to people that I didn't have anything to do with it. And that I wish that I had seen it before it ran because I would have advocated that it not um, be published. But, um, but that just shows you kind of how, and we, and we have commissioned things to respond to it. I commissioned a piece by Padma Lakshmi to respond to it. And we've got some recipe pieces coming up. Um, and you can learn and understand more about cultures through cooking their food. If you let yourself, if you approach it in, a, in an open-minded, uh, respectful way, you can also really close yourself off to it. I have a lot of readers who, um, you know, they, they just um, really rebel when we call for certain ingredients that, that are unfamiliar to them. And it can, it can be really upsetting to them. And, and I've found it really upsetting in response. We had a, we have a live chat with um, readers every Wednesday at the Post. And I remember Last year, there was someone who wrote in and said, I actually wrote it down here so that I could tell you guys a story because I thought it might be appropriate. Um, this person wrote in and said, why do you publish so many recipes with weird ingredients that a lot of people don't have and don't have access to? I get that people like international food, but with money tight, buying some weird Asian spice to try on one dish and maybe only once is a waste of money. And I said, and I got a lot of flack from some people for this too, although a lot of people really appreciated it. I said, 
Thank you for your thoughts, but I wish you would re-examine your concept of weird. Frankly, I find it offensive to hear this way of thinking about cuisines that are certainly very familiar to plenty of people because, you know, it's their native cuisine, even if they're not as familiar to you. Now, especially is a good time for all of us to check our assumptions about what we call normal or standard or any of the other code words for, let's be honest, white. You know, and I went on to say that we do try to provide substitutions and we want people to be able to make our recipes, but also that every ingredient is available at the click of a button on Amazon these days. And so, um, you know, not to show for Amazon because parenthetical Jeffrey Bezos owns the Washington Post. Um, but, um, you know, in this day and age, it's, it's, it's really easy to get anything. So, so that's just all to say that I think that recipe writing and recipe coverage and recipe journalism can be a way to explain um, cultures to people and help people understand cultures if they're ready for it. So when you make uh, your food, your work, um, and when you, when you see like physically how the sausage is made, does it, ever <laughs> take, does it ever take the beauty or the comfort out of food, out of like, like a simple, good home cooked meal, or does it only help you appreciate food all the more? We, yes and no. Um, one of the things that a lot of us food journalists talk about a lot is there's a, this particular phenomenon that happens. Okay, so you, this, this happens a lot with recipe stories. So you, especially deep dive. So you decide that you want to write about, you know, okay, bagels, how to make bagels. Um, and, you know, you do all this research and you try these recipes, you, you talk to experts, you get all these tips, you spend weeks and weeks and weeks, you know, testing them, changing them, tweaking them, and you come up with something that you, you know, are really happy with. Um, but you've made so many bagels by the point that you have to write the story that at the very moment that you need to muster up the enthusiasm to describe them in a positive way, you could not be sicker of them. <laughs> so that does happen. I don't think that it, for me and for the um, for my staff, what we usually talk about are like individual foods like that or individual recipes. I don't I don't think it ends up happening, at least not to me. That generally, food, the joy of food, um, goes away. If if anything, what happens is the more you learn about it and the more you understand about something is how something is made the sausage, or for me, the, the veggie sausage, um, you, you appreciate it that much more when you experience something that's really done well, um, and you know it. And so you're that much more excited when you, when you run into it. But there is that phenomenon of like, oh my God, I'm so sick of this food that I have to write about right now. Um, so while every meal and dish and piece of food is different how do you bring variety to the way you describe food you know oh, uh, how do you make how do you make the soup is amazing more interesting than, <laughs> than the soup is amazing right right and that's such a good question that's such a good question and for anybody who writes about food it becomes clear to you pretty early on that you need to get away from the adjectives um and trying to describe um, maybe the way that something tastes. One thing that I say to, uh, that I've said to, to reporters before is, I don't want to be, in, I don't want, I don't want to be in your mouth. Like, don't, like, don't tell me what's going on in your mouth. <laughs> like, I, I mean, maybe some people can do it well, but most of the time it becomes very tedious. So I think what's more important is to describe, um, some of the feelings that are around the experience of making and eating the food. So what I do to shake things up myself is I look for other ways of, of writing about it. I talk to other people, you know, like I try to talk, like I, I write a lot about recipes that I get from cookbooks and maybe I tweak them a little bit here and there, but, but I want to showcase other people's work. So that can help too, is to ask people like, what do you like about this? Why did you, um, come up with this? How did you come up with this? Is this something that your mother made for you? Or is this adapted from something that your mother made for you? And then you can start to think about maybe telling some more stories around the dishes and you're not having to depend on just 
you know, the soup is amazing or the soup is, you know, creamy enough or it's, you know, whatever you can say, uh, okay, I'll, I'll give you a really quick example before we start taking some questions. So a couple of years ago, a cookbook author um, who I know from conferences reached out to me and said, she said, you know, I think you might be interested in this as a possible story. One of my readers um, told me that this he, he's been making this recipe for this lentil soup that I had in a book 25 years ago. He's been making it and eating it every day for work for 20 years. So he's an, and, it, and he wrote to her and she passed along the email that he wrote to her and he thanked her for it. He said like, he's a creature of habit, obviously. And like every Sunday night, he made this big batch and he divided it up into like five, you know, um containers and he took it with him to work every day and so I called him and you know it was during it was when the pandemic was getting gut was you know really raging and it turns out that he's a hospice nurse um and so I talked to him about the comfort that he found in something so dependable as the lentil soup recipe but I was also and it was a funny piece because it was a little bit about how quirky this guy is to want to eat to be able to eat the same thing for lunch every day for 20 years um and so then you're able to say like our headline on that story on that recipe was you know try the soup that you know is so good you know this nurse has eaten it every work day for 20 years um rather than you know it's amazing <laughs> Oh, this has just been wonderful. And Zoe, you've been asking fabulous questions. Really good questions. And providing, you know, really in-depth answers. I'm actually going to combine uh, a question from Jan Davis, one of the donors, and Randy, who's a high school student. Um, so Jan wanted to know about your growing up in Texas, your family mm -hmm. background, and your connection to food. Mm -hmm. And Randy wants to know, being a high school student in a small town, how do I get to the place of being a food critic on a popular mm. news source? What would be your preparation as a high school student? So if you could combine both of those sure. your journey and give Randy some tips. Sure. Okay. So my journey, I have to say uh, the biggest really thing from my childhood that affected me was when I was growing up in um, the West Texas town of San Angelo um city um uh you know my dad was in the air force and my parents were divorced and um my you know we were sort of the last stop on his tour of air force bases um where i was born before they got a divorce and um my mother was a single mom raising a lot of kids and um she really depended on the uh commissary the discount commissary grocery at the air force base in order to be able to afford food every week but when they got divorced she lost base privileges but she is a very resourceful person and she discovered a loophole which was that her children did not lose base privileges there were two of us left in the house at this point um uh my sister who was 10 at the time and i who was eight and my sister, for some reason, had no, she got out of it. But my mother asked me if I wanted to do all the grocery shopping for the family at age eight. And so I did. And she took me to the base um, every Saturday with cash and a list. And our deal was if I got everything on the list and came in under budget, I could buy something for myself. So that was my incentive because I wanted my Dr. Pepper and I wanted my Mr. Good Bar and I would comparison shop um, and try to make sure that I also knew I had to eat the stuff. So I, I learned how to look for quality, um, you know, and a good price at the age of eight. And um, it was, it, it affected me a lot because of course it gave me this sense of independence um, and, but I also became really interested in what she was doing with the food when she got home. I hadn't really helped her cook that much up until then, but then I started getting really interested. Um, and, and so that's sort of what really set me off. I mean, I, um, I 
cooked for myself all through college. I was also really poor in college. Like I just, I had no money. Um, thankfully, you know, when I started at UT, it, the tuition was $4 a semester hour. Um, and I would, and I needed that. Um, I, I have to, you know, not to get too um, in the weeds about this, but I, um, my father cut me off when he found out that I was gay. Um, so I had to put myself through school. So um, I, you know, also learned how to eat nutritiously for very little money um, when I was, when I was putting myself through school. Um, and, you know, and I worked at the Daily Texan um, for four years and I um, was editor of Utmost. Um, and, and then I went to, uh, moved to Boston when I graduated from UT because I think I wanted, um, you know, a change from Texas. And I, I wanted to go somewhere where it seemed like there were a lot of newspapers. <laughs> um, and there were at the time, there aren't quite so many anymore, but, um, and, um, and I worked in journalism for, uh, yeah, until I was almost 30. And then I started, I worked at community newspapers and I went to New Hampshire and edited a paper. And then I came back to Boston and edited a little um, neighborhood paper. And then I went to the Boston Globe as a copy editor. And while I was there, there was just a certain point where, um, well, I'll tell you what happened. I was up for a promotion. I didn't get it. And it was in news and it was the first time that I, it was honestly the first time that I didn't get a job that I wanted. And I was, and I, and I, and I was relieved. And so then it kind of shook me up. Like, why am I relieved? And I started realizing that I was maybe not as drawn to the news, um, the hard news stuff as I had been. Um, and so I ended up going to culinary school. I realized that I, my passion was food and that I had always talked to chefs and interviewed food people and loved that. And those were my favorite stories. And so um, I went to culinary school. And then while I was working nights at the Globe, I went to culinary school during the day um, and then uh, just moved my career toward food journalism. Um, Randy, so what you need to do is eat as many different kinds of food as you possibly can. Um, and one of the things that you can do now um, that you couldn't do before, or you know, before the internet, is you can publish your own work. You can publish it on a blog, you can publish it on social media, you could make videos for TikTok, you could find ways to tell stories. And just in case you think TikTok is all dance videos, I have to tell you, you can look at an account like, um, like the Korean vegan is a really good example. This is a woman who ostensibly is making videos about Korean vegan versions of Korean recipes, but she tells the most beautiful, heart-wrenching, lovely stories um, while she's um, showing the videos. So you have all sorts of opportunities to do it. The other thing that I would say, as much as you possibly can afford, scrimp and save and do whatever you can, travel. Travel and try food from different places in the places where the food comes from and try to learn, ask a lot of questions um, and start to get to know like what you like and what you don't like and just start putting it out there. That's what I would do, Randy. <laughs> that's that's amazing i'll let zoe ask the next three questions and then i have a final question for you okay yeah so um claire asks what was your go-to meal when you were a college student oh yeah that's such a good question <laughs> such a good question well i have to say like there were there were there were lots of ramen noodles there were lots of ramen noodles and I remember that, um, you know, there were times when I was in the store and I was trying to decide, do I want to get another 10 packages of ramen noodles for a dollar or would I like a little cheese? You know, <laughs> it was like one of those. Um, but I'll tell you one thing that I started really doing a lot that, that sort certainly, um, people who know me now would not find this surprising at all. Cause I just wrote a, I wrote a, my last cookbook was called cool beans, which is about, um, which is about beans. 
And one of the things that I depended on a lot in college was, was uh, cooking beans from dried because they were so cheap. You know, they were, uh, you know, a couple dollars for a pound of beans and, and that gets you, you know, a pound of beans, you know, that gets you like eight meals. So, um, so I did that a lot. Um, and I would do like lots of little like stir fries with like cat because cabbage and potatoes are also cheap. So I would do like cabbage and potatoes and beans. And uh, when I could afford it, I would buy like big family packs of, I kind I don't eat meat now, but I liked those like thin cut pork chops. And I would like do little pan fried pork chops with like cabbage um, a lot. Okay. So Laurie asks, when is it okay to write a negative restaurant review? Oh, um, now, um, um, let's see, I'm not entirely sure how you mean that, Laurie, but um, I think it's okay. Okay, here, here's, some, here's some general thoughts. I don't think it's okay to go seek out some little mom and pop restaurant that people don't even know about um, and trash them because they, they weren't even, they were just minding their business, trying to do their work. Now, where I think it's, where I feel much better about it is when it's a well-known restaurant, a well-known chef, a restaurant that has a PR company behind them. Boy, those are fair game. Um, anybody that has, you know, that has um, backing behind them, I think I'm more comfortable with. I mean, the other restaurants, like the mom and pop restaurants, and I have a columnist who writes about um, what we call casual dining, and that's his philosophy. Like, he wants to point you to places that you might not have known about that are doing a really good job. Now, will he say in that review, um, you know, like, one time the chicken was a little bit drier than the other time. Like, yeah, maybe he'll have something like that, like that in there, but it won't be a, like, this place is terrible. Um, because if it's terrible, he's just not going to write about it. On the other side of the spectrum, um, our main food critic, Tom Sietzema, has certainly written very negative reviews, um, not, very, not super often, but about really popular places that he thinks people deserve to no, that they should stay away from. <laughs> There's a place in DC called Founding Farmers. It's a, and, and he has written very negative reviews um, about them and they can handle it. <laughs> um, so Rose asks, what separates good from great food journalism? Oh, that's such a good question. I want to add one little thing to my last answer too. And I should say, um, I think a lot of critics were for a little while giving restaurants a bit of a pass during the pandemic too, you know, when all restaurants were suffering so much. So there was, we, we did sort of lay off of the super, you know, the really negative stuff there for a while, but we're sort of coming back to at least that being a possibility. Okay. So the difference between good and great food journalism. Um, wow. Okay. I mean, I think that it's the same as the difference between any good and great journalism. Um, great journalism, um, food or otherwise, um, changes the world, right? It, it, um, it comforts the afflicted and afflicts the comfortable. Um, it, uh, it makes you think, uh, maybe makes you think differently about something. It exposes you to something that you weren't aware of. It leads to greater understanding of the world. Um, it's certainly a big part of food journalism is it gives you something really fabulous to make for dinner. Um, you know, I think good, yeah, great, great journalism changes your, your mindset. So Julia asks, um, what do you suggest in terms of getting an internship in the food journalism field? Apply. Um, <laughs> um, you know, they're hard to come by and it's difficult because there's fewer and fewer outlets. Um, 
like at the Washington Post, we don't have a food journalism internship. We have internships in our features department and the interns um, get to do stints in all of the features um, sections, including food. And we've had interns that specialize or that have a particular interest in food and they've gotten to do a little more maybe than others. Um, I mean, I would say, you know, I, I really don't like unpaid internships as a principal um, because I think everybody deserves to be paid for their work. Um, but it depends on the market and what you're able to find, I suppose. Um, I would say, <clears throat> you know, it can be interesting to think about concentrating on if you feel like the journalism, your journalism training has, is there or you've gotten the training that you want. Um, you could think about specializing in some food, in some food training. So you could cook in a restaurant, stage, they call it in a restaurant. And that's like a free internship, you know, where you spend a period, but it can be as short as you want, where you're just exposed to cooking from a different um, standpoint. Um, or, you know, there certainly are a lot of food websites that can use help. Um, it's just a matter of finding, finding the really good fit for you. But I would say, you know, there's always a possibility of letting, letting the, um, getting your journalism training in one manner and then getting your food training in another and then combining the two. But the best, the best um, training for food journalism, for any journalism, right? The best training is just to do it. So any way you can find to just do it. And if you're, you know, I suggested to Randy earlier, getting his stuff out there, um, writing or on social media. I do think that the one thing that we miss, that we've missed with a lot of that, with blogs and, um, and other strategies has been editing. So, um, and I don't just mean correcting people's commas, although that stuff drives me nuts, as you might imagine, but I mean, um, mentorship, right? Like people who will help you take your work to the next level, who will help you hone your work, help you understand what might be working better than, 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 than not, um, a good editor. I've always said a good editor helps you sound more like yourself. So, you know, sharpens your, helps you learn how to sharpen your own voice um, rather than just instituting theirs. So finding someone who can do that for you, even if it's a friend, a friend of a friend, um, you know, a contact that you make through your fabulous journalism school, um, you know, any way you can find someone who's able to give you regular feedback about your work if you're not working professionally in the field, I think will, will help. Well, I'm back from my internet problems, but I have one last question. Um, Jim Davis, who um, sponsors this event and we wanna thank him for it, said he used to work in a hamburger stand while he was at UT and still many years later avoids raw onions. Mm -hmm. Is there any food you avoid? I won't eat beets. Even when I was oh, like yeah, no at beets. the New yeah. York Times, no beets, sorry. Wow, I'm sorry. I love beets. Um, <laughs> no, everybody has them. For me, um, okay, there's a couple. I I really am not a huge fan, generally, of raisins. Um, I just I don't know. They're like little chewy sugar balls, and I just like I, I don't I don't really like them. I prefer things tart tartar. Than that I have a sweet tooth but I also really like sour flavors and tart flavors so to me like I don't understand the purpose of a raisin um and the other thing that I don't really love I don't love green peppers um and I just don't love the taste of green peppers and later when I started gardening more and I grow a lot of you know I've grown a lot of food I realized that it's because they're not ripe <laughs> they want to turn into a red pepper and you haven't let them um <laughs> So yeah, those are a couple. It's funny, Julia put into um, the Q&A, ah, oh, oatmeal raisin cookies. I think there's nothing more disappointing than thinking something is a chocolate chip cookie and it turns out to be a raisin. 
oh. right like what are they doing in my and I love an oatmeal cookie but I like a pure oatmeal cookie I just think it's perfect the way it is and I don't think you need those raisins in there or if you're gonna do it I would do dried cranberries or dried cherries I love dried cherries that's just me <laughs> you all have done such a fabulous job Zoe and Joe have given us the first lecture of our food journalism course that we're going to offer. And I Great. think we're going to need to invite <laughs> them back to do it live. Sure. So, I, so we have a food journalism course in the books and I can see using your books and food, um, food section and other stuff. And my internet's about to break down again. So I'm just going to say thank you so much for joining us all. Thank you and for having me. This has been marvelous. Thank, let's all give them a virtual hand. And thank you, Jim, Jan, and Rachel. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kathleen, for, for having me. And thank you, Zoe, for the great questions and everybody in the audience. Thank you. And I will get contact information from Joe and share it with sure. the group.